Perfect. Okay, here we go. All right. So we're excited again to have Lisa Rubikoff on. Lisa, great to see you. Great to Good see seeing you me. guys too. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. So we gave a task to Lisa. I mean, we, she's helped us in the past listening to recordings to, to see if the people who were talking were deceptive or they're kind of they're doing any sort of kind of games to, you know, because Lisa is a trained polygrapher, deception uh, analyst, expert, all this stuff. She does all this work. And so we really wanted to see because we've been getting a lot of feedback on Jesse's testimony. You know, the, the interviews that we did with him while he was in prison because everybody was we had those that truth blog come out saying that he did it and his family thinks he did it. Everybody, you know, and but it's when we talked to him after waiting a year after all this accusation happened, we thought it was interesting after we talked to him. And but we weren't sure exactly because we still to this day, this Molly and Cole case, we don't know who did it. OK, all we know is that the people that were there when they disappeared and all that stuff. So we don't know who did it. So we want to do our due diligence. And we sent this stuff off to Lisa to listen to to give get her feedback on Jesse's interviews that we did with him back to back. And as you can tell, Lisa, we, we hit him pretty hard with all the questions that we needed to hit him. So just first of all, I wanted to hear your overall impression of what you thought of what Jesse said and the tone and the tenor, and then give us uh, what you think you're, what he's, if he's being deceptive. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with the fact that if I, I wish the type of interview and the forthcomingness that he exposed to both of you over these interviews is the same exposure I would get from anyone that I've ever interviewed past, present, and future. The transparency was a hundred percent there um, his tone, his mannerisms, it sounded like a conversation amongst friends. That's how comfortable he was speaking with both of you. The fact that there were no hesitations when he was speaking, there was no delayed speech, and he just shot from the hip every time with every one of his responses. I did not feel at any point in time during either recording that you had sent me to observe and listen to that there was any deception present. He was admitting to things that he didn't even have to. And considering the circumstances of what he's in right now, given the fact of what his charges were and what he pled to, he's not fighting it. He's owned up to everything that he's done at any point in time. So from complete transparency and as a, and a credibility assessment expert, and I've been doing this now 13 years as a certified and trained polygraph examiner, and not only am I an examiner, I'm also an instructor. So I teach these type of skills in these courses to other examiners to at various different police agencies around the country. Um, and I'm going to deem him completely credible and that there's no sign of deception in anything that he's determined to have said. Interesting. I mean, we kind of feel the same way. I mean, I've met him in person. I have a pretty good instinct on people. And I just felt like he was owning his shit. He was yeah. owning it. He was owning his stuff. He wasn't trying to, you know, say he didn't do what he's in jail for, which most people that we've come across, I'm sure you have to immediately yeah. say, oh, I'm innocent. He's never said that. He's always said, I'm guilty of this, but I didn't kill them. You know, and. Yeah, yeah. I, that I thought was really interesting. And in the fact that when he didn't know something, he was like, I don't know. And I'm not going to say because I don't know, because that's what people are doing to me. So, yeah, and I think that's a big piece of it also is that he's owning up to everything that he's done, pa past and present, to whatever the situation is going on amongst the various charges. He's not shifting blame, and that's a huge thing. When you have someone that is guilty, they will shift blame onto someone else and come up with another reason as to why they're in the predicament that they are. He's not doing any of that. And just like you mentioned, Rob, he's not blaming someone, and he's not throwing shit out there, a name, a narrative, a story just to try and get closure for his brother's murder. And I think that's important because there's so much speculation that's out there. And there's so many different trains that are running off the track with everyone's different narrative that he's not creating another narrative. He's not being a family member that has lost um, a relative and that is just shooting from the hip and just assuming whatever it wants. He's only speaking fact and he's not making up fiction. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting too. And the fact that, you know, and the thing is, you only heard 
the two like basically edited podcasts that we did we interviewed him we have six hours of interview with him and and it's literally we wanted to ask him the same question each time the same set of questions each time to see if his story would change and it didn't like we went through all of them we're like you know what can we take from this and he he was consistent with everything so that was another for us a big sign that you know maybe he is telling the truth maybe he didn't have anything to do with it and so once again and like and he is just so you know he's been he's been questioned by law enforcement he's been like numerous times federal agencies a couple times both in custody and out of custody and so it was really interesting to see how he didn't really he didn't vary and the only thing that's different now than from what he did before is that he was still kind of uh feeling the after effects of his drug addiction when he was inside jail when he was first arrested because he was using now it's been a year and a half where he's been inside completely clean. He's, you know, he's getting all these programs where he's trying to get off his, his uh, addiction. And so he was clear headed, very clear headed. Yeah, that does play a big role, whether or not the individual is impaired and or coming down from drug usage or even alcohol abuse, because it does affect the memory. And the best time to do the interview is after what's referred to as like detox window when the individual should be starting to recover about 30 to 45 days getting everything out of their system and not to fault law enforcement but when you do have a crime and you do have a situation going on where you do need to interview suspects or witnesses sometimes drug involvement does come into play but it also has to be taken into account the fact that the individual is impaired and so you have to almost take what they're saying with a grain of salt but you still do need to follow up with the leads of whatever they are saying. But there has to be some sort of light bulb that does go off of like, hey, there is some sort of impairment that is going on. So we just need to make note of that. And I think also when an individual is currently impaired or they are coming down from drugs, the type of interview that is given has to be differentiated than someone that is stone cold sober and cognizant and aware of what's going on. So there has to be a little bit of hand holding going on. And I do believe that that comes down to training from law enforcement that does have to take place of how to handle a suspect given a certain circumstance. Uh, maybe someone with regard to training of, let's say, someone has a learning disability or a speech impediment or cognitive processing or drugs or alcohol, or better yet, if they're a victim of a crime themselves previously, maybe they have PTSD of interacting with law enforcement. Maybe they're not going to want to be so forthcoming or so truthful because of how they've been jaded about their previous charges. So there's a lot that does come into play when conducting an interview and different variables in it. But I think that in terms of this situation, the interview that you guys conducted was amazing because again, you knew because you've been in this, you've been in this genre for long enough that, you know, always ask the question more than once, change the phrasing, bring it up again later. Or what I like to do is when I do an interview, I'll ask the question, did A, B, and C happen? And then I'll go ahead and I'll re-ask the question later and I'll switch up the order of like, did DBA happen or whatever it is? Or sometimes I'll withhold information to see if they'll come forward and give that to me back. Mm, Interesting. And the other thing I wanted to say is um, when you talked about some people who have like, you know, you said, learn, you know, learning disabilities or drug addiction, stuff like that. You said being a little bit of hand holding. Can you give us an example? Like if you had someone like Jesse, who's just coming down off of, you know, methamphetamine use and how would you couch the questions in a way where you hope to get the, the best possible result resulting answer from him? So in that situation, I would use what we like to refer to as uh, mind maps or, cog- or cognitive imaging. Um, which is pretty much just a visual graphic. It almost looks like um, the shape, I guess, is the best way to explain it is like when we went to when we were in school growing up and we were dealing with like English language arts and you had that spider web graphic where you put your topic in the center and you have all your little circles branching out. But we use that in terms of polygraph and interviewing when talking about a specific part of the crime. Where let's say in this situation, I would talk about maybe the co- the center would be like the weapon. And then outside would be all the different types of weapons that they're aware of. And we build these maps together. So that way we stay focused on the center topic and then we add to the actual visual graphic as a whole. 
And also in interviewing, sometimes I come with these pre-made um, either about specific crimes or allegations. Um, and that way we can go ahead and make sure that I, that I know that the person I'm working with fully understands the language. They fully mm -hmm. understand what exactly it is that we're talking about. So if they don't have an understanding, they have the ability to actually ask me and say, look, this word's on the piece of paper. I don't know what this says. Can you explain to me what it says? So it comes down to just language and then cognitive awareness. Um, and then from there, it also gives them ownership. I like using the visual graphics for the ownership component because it allows them to take part in the interview. Whereas I'm not just speaking to them, they're actively participating in assisting with the investigation by giving me the information. So it comes down to tangibility and the tactility of actually sometimes holding the paper. And then sometimes what I like to do is give them the physical paper. And then I like to look at how far is the paper from them? So for example, I'll just pick up this post-it here. So if you hand me this piece of paper, Cindy, and I hold it close to my chest, this means I know that there's some sort of importance to me pertaining to the information that's on the paper. But yet if you give it to me and I hold it so far away from my body, this means I want nothing to do with it. Whatever's on here, I don't like. So it comes down to understanding and having the training of even distance of even photographs, um, let's say if there's an individual being interviewed and they show a photograph of the deceased, it's get either get that away from me or they pull it closer. It shows their relationship to either the victim and or the crime. And it's up to the investigator as well as interviewer to determine what exactly that relationship is. That's fascinating. So you can con unconsciously, subconsciously see what their behavior is to that piece of information, physical piece of information that represents something in the crime that they may or may not be uncomfortable with. And that, and that can be a clue as to whether or not they're being deceptive. Yeah. You can show That's them crime scene photos. You can show them um, photos of the actual weapon. You can even go in there and bring in photos from other crime scenes that have nothing to do with this one, just to see how they react. Because Let's say law enforcement knows that the murder victim, uh, that the murder weapon is a gun and the person sitting that's being interviewed, they have information, but maybe they have information not pertaining to the murder weapon. So you can go ahead and see how they react and how they respond to the visual graphics that are presided to them. And that's how PD can then go ahead and say, OK, well, I've managed to take a look at their face. I've read their body language. Have they shifted in their chair? Have they gotten up and just walked out of the, like attempted to walk out of the room or did they get up and get out of their seat and walk to the other side of the room? Like how much distance do they put themselves um, between themselves and whatever we're presenting to them? That's so fascinating. Um, as yeah. far as this is concerned, because you're listening to a recording that you didn't take yourself that, you know, was given to you from us that was on the podcast. Can you give us a little bit of insight into your process and how you're able to distinguish whether or not he's being deceptive or not? Yeah, so when I'm going ahead and I'm just presented audio versus video, audio I like to go ahead and just do one listen through. And that way I can kind of get a flow with the conversation and just to get an idea of even just the environmental factors to make sure that there is no significant outside noise, to make sure that there is no other language or any people in the background. Because the biggest fear sometimes is when a recorded statement's being taken place, especially if you're doing it from a facility, you don't know if there's a guard standing behind you. You don't know if you have another inmate next to you. You don't know if um, the head of the unit pertaining to, let's say, if there's some sort of gang environment in that, in that specific pod or that cluster is on the other side of the room. Um, when you're dealing with small counties, sometimes you're going to, if you're an inmate, you may run into someone that you went to high school with. I mean, you did someone else that may have knowledge of the case. So I like to get an idea of these factors if I hear anything in the background. And then from there, I'll just do a one through. And then the second time I'll go through and I'm active listening for delayed hesitations. I'm listening for language. I'm listening for um, change of pronouns. I'm listening for just overall um auditory morale as i like to call it are they keeping the same flow are they keeping the same pace um is there again is there hesitation is there rejection of answering your questions is there a refusal to go ahead and continue the the conversation so these are all different things that i like to listen for and while you were listening to jesse's interview what is your like analysis of that 
again, he is transparent, forthcoming, non-oppositional. He's providing you guys information that you guys didn't even have before pertaining to details of certain characters and places. And he's cooperating with you. Um, I would only hope that if law enforcement were to go ahead and re-interview him again, because I don't know the last time he was interviewed, if he would continue to provide this information. Because I would hate that if law enforcement had him um, put in the box of a drug user or a like a convict or perp or however you want to label him, that they compartmentalized him into that box, that they no longer want to work with him as a resource for their investigation. Because they figured out oh, he's just a junkie. What is he going to do for us? And that's sometimes what we see also in investigations where there's um, – a, a bias that's presented against either a witness or a victim. And then there's just a lack of resources is put forward for them. Yeah. Right? Well, he's like, like I said, from this case has been going on for 11 years. Okay. Yeah. We've been dealing with this case since 2018, 19, uh, both from the documentary perspective and also the close to 60 hours of podcast that of, of interview and, you know, deep dive yeah. in there. Us, as well as other people who investigated the case, not once has Jesse's name has come up in the beginning parts of the case. Because usually everything that comes up, the names that came up in the first week to 48 hours of the case are still the names that have still been bantered around in this yeah. case. Jesse's name was never one of them, not even close. And and now it's, you know, out of after 10 years uh, there was this one local uh, yeah. reserve police officer who you've heard that who we had a relationship with and we were working with because um, we felt like he had a, you know, he was doing it for all the right reasons. And then he went off the range and he decided that he heard something about Jesse and he started down that road. And we were like, OK, and I'm like, and we didn't know. I mean, you know, we're not boots on the ground there. Yeah. We're like, maybe this is possibly, could it be, could it be like, uh, I didn't really think so. Cause I had met him for the TV show. And like I said, my gut is pretty strong. I didn't feel that he was involved. Yeah. We and we didn't have any proof that he was. And we knew there was no, he didn't have a cell phone. We checked all that. We did a background check on him. We knew that he had been arrested for a domestic issue that was dismissed in 2007. We knew of his background with drugs. We knew he had been arrested numerous times for drugs, but there was nothing that suggested anything to do with this. Nothing. Yeah. You know, and the people who were telling us like family members saying that they, they had, you know, that he was dangerous and all this stuff and that he could, he could have killed Colt. And, you know, and then we hear from other people saying that, well, those two loved each other. You know, those two were, you know, we, we had, and, and so it was very weird because we weren't sure what to make of it. And so we, you know, when all that information came out, I mean, we had pretty much looked at everything that we could possibly look at. So we kind of went down for like a year to just see, you know, because we weren't sure what was going on. Also to give law enforcement, because the, exactly. the Bureau of Indian Affairs took over the case. And so we were like, okay, let them do their investigation. We don't want to impede on anything. Yeah. Our whole goal with the podcast was to get attention on it, to get some movement, to get some answers. So we figured, okay, we'll take a step back. But we didn't realize during that time that this that this guy was going to go after Jesse like full blown to the point where there was like rumors of, um, you know, missing persons flyers of Molly and Colt being taken down and people saying, oh, the case is solved. It's solved. solved. Jesse did it. Jesse did it. And even his sister has been coming out. You know, she's kind of paired up with these people. And, and you know, we, we just don't understand. Re regardless, there's a narrative that has been been crafted and against Jesse. And like I said, he, he came out and he interviewed with us on camera. His interview, unfortunately didn't make the show because it got, you know, it got cut, but he sat with Cindy and spoke to her for two, three hours, you know, and about, so we never got a feeling. I mean, he was still just on the throes of just getting off of addiction, but he's like in that in between point where he's, you know, he was, um, he, he became an ordained minister. He was trying to figure out his life and, you know, he's trying to make amends, but he was like the last person we thought that would, that could have been a possible suspect. So when it all came out like this way, we were like, oh, and then we just randomly, we were just like, hey, listen, this is all bubbling up. So, so Rosini reached out to him and in, in prison and that's what resulted there. It wasn't like, and like everyone thinks that there was a lot of prep for that interview. He got no prep. He, we didn't tell him anything we were going to ask him. 
No, and I didn't even know if he was going to respond because he waited. He didn't respond right away. He took a, he took a few days to think about it, and then he responded back, and then we just started talking immediately. There was no like, oh, I'm going to interview you for the podcast. It was like, okay, yeah, I'll do this. Let me tell what I have to tell. I, w- I just want to tell my, yeah. you know, what I yeah. know and what and I the don't fact, know. And the fact that this, you know, this reserve or cop, whatever you want to call him, um, who had only been a cop for about four years, five years. He's retired. He's in his mid sixties. Um, he doesn't have investigative interview technique training, um, was the one that was hammering him. And you heard the way he was questioning him by Jesse repeating it, very leading questions and saying stuff like, you know, well, if I, if that was my brother and he did this with my girl, he goes, I would have definitely killed him. You know, it's like such a loaded leading question. Now, what, what is that like? Like, I mean, would that ever happen in a, in a law enforcement interview? I hate to say it, it's been done before. And that's the difference between a good cop and a bad cop. And there are some shitty ones out there. And I, I mean, I hate throwing law enforcement under the bus, but there are some bad cops out there that give the good cops the bad, the, the reputations that everyone's just a bad one. And that's where you get the guys that are just trying to close a case. They'll ask these leading questions. They'll go ahead and say, oh, well, if this was me, I would do this and blah, 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 trying to get them to agree. Because once they go, okay, I would agree, I'd do it too, boom, you almost have a confession right there. And so many times, that's why you end up some of these cases with wrongful convictions and the work that the Innocence Project is doing. And we, you and I, all three of us go on and on of just about that alone. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. From the work that we've done, but you're dealing with leading questions, misinformation, you're dealing with um, law enforcement that's using interview techniques that are technically no longer approved per se, or they're not widely recognized anymore. But um, what this guy was doing was absolutely horrible. The, and um, it, I mean, I don't know what his background was prior to being a reservist or an auxiliary or whatever you want to call it for their agency. He worked in the corporate sector. Okay. So he worked in the corporate sector. So he's volunteering and donating his time to his community as an auxiliary police officer, where you go and you don't go to a full academy. You just go possibly go to a couple of meetings, you get sworn in, you're given a patrol car and your purpose as an auxiliary is to go ahead and just uh, drive around the neighborhood and just reinforce safety. If someone's broken down on the side of the road, you call law enforcement. If you're patrolling shopping centers to make sure that there's no theft or if there's a current situation, maybe you have a detail where um, a synagogue or a mosque or some sort of church called and said, hey, listen, we need an, we need someone to sit outside as a deterrent for crime. Do me a favor, have someone there. And that's what yeah. they go ahead and do. But they're, non, they're not responding to calls. They're there to assist active law enforcement. They are yeah. volunteers. Well, that was, that, that was the big problem. He did go through so a certification pro, uh, program yeah. called CLEAT. And, yep. you know, which a lot, all the law enforcement does, but it's more of a certificate. It's not like a training academy. It's, you yeah. know, I'm sure it's not as extensive, but it's at the same point, academy. yes. And so, but he didn't, but the first thing they brought him on, like initially the Love County Sheriff's Department brought them on for him to look into a double, possible double homicide case. Why would you bring in someone like this to do that? And then the the other oh. department he went to did the same thing. They said they wanted to look in. I mean, we spoke to the chief of police down at that one place, and he said, "Well, listen, I have nothing to do with the Molly and Colt investigation. You know, that was something that this other officer was doing on his own time, or mm-hmm. when he was looking into it. But what he was really doing is he was he was spending a lot of time, as you heard in the recordings, with Jesse, basically." you know, paying for things for him and gracing, knowing that Jesse was probably doing illegal things. And then, cause he would, he would call me right after he would speak to Jesse. He says, Oh, he's doing this. I'm going to arrest him. There's going to be an arrest. I'm going to arrest him for this. Like that. He, so doesn't, he, have, he doesn't have culpability or capability to actually enforce the arrest. Well, so- no, for arrest, for using drugs and having like a firearm. Cause he was a, you know, he, he wasn't supposed to have a firearm. So he was, and he was staying in this house and he, and Jesse yeah. was telling me, yeah, I did this, I did that. So he knew that, if he showed up with some cops, he was going to be able to charge him with something. Well, again, he would have to go ahead and actually speak to the active law enforcement and say, hey, listen, I have grounds for this. 
But then at the and other I think side, he did. He did. I think he did do that with the one police department that he was working with because the, that's what the chief said. He said he wasn't an auxiliary. He was working. A he was like a working reserve. for them under this cleat thing. Yeah. He and, has something hard on for Jesse, and that's what pisses me off. To oh, go yeah. so far to to write that letter that he did. And to disseminate a bullshit letter that he did, that Jesse didn't even write, pretending it's a confession. I mean, the guys get serious mental health issues. This is this is just. Well, it, the thing is, I he he would tell me that Jesse confessed, and he actually, and this is another thing, he shared the his body cam interview with him me yeah. while Jesse was in county, where he said that, you know, Jesse confessed, and I'm like, I'm looking at it. He sent it to Paula. She looked at it. We, we're like, "Where's the confession?" We I don't look, hear we anything. Don't hear anything? We're, I hear Jack. I hear Jackie talking, but I don't hear. I don't get hear me anything. that video. I want it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. But 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 just the the fact that he shared it with us was kind of like I was like stunned because it's you know it's evidentiary stuff. Well, that's also I just wanna, yeah. I just want to see what the chief called him because I don't want to get it wrong. That's fine. I mean. It's, um, he says, uh, he said, we did commission Bates to work alongside with the other agencies. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I mean, they have some. You, this you is never from know. the chief of police. So I don't know what exactly he's talking about. I mean, about. commission yeah. could be the fact of like, we've, he is a, he is a reservist and because a reservist is another word for auxiliary and volunteer. Yeah. That's a, on the East Coast. That's what we call. We call them auxiliary cops. Right. Yeah, we call, exactly. We call love the East Coaster. Yeah. We call mm -hmm. them auxiliary. Like my dad's an auxiliary police officer. Mm -hmm. Like that's yeah. Me. My father is an auxiliary police officer in Florida. I'm not gonna drop what county or whatever it is, but like that's what he does. He's volunteering his time because he's retired. Yeah. He's got a background in law enforcement, and mm -hmm. so. He went through and he went through a mini academy. He goes yeah. ahead and he's in, he's in the car, and that's what they do. They're there to assist the community. Exactly. But there's there's like a tiered level of like what they can and cannot do, and he obviously knows because he's in the right frame of mind. If there's a serious situation, to call dispatch. He's not going to be there just thinking he's Zorro or some sort of Power Ranger. Well, no, he, that's the thing. It, because it's such a rural community area yeah. and they don't have a lot of police officers, they do allow. I mean, he told me he he was arresting people like he would stop and he would arrest people and he would he would go out and find people and arrest them. I mean, it's like to me, it's like when you're talking about, you know, reservists or auxiliary cops. I yeah. mean, any, you know, if you go through the training, anybody can do it. I mean, Shaquille O'Neal is a is an auxiliary cop. Yeah, you know? I know. Down in Florida, I think it's down in Florida. In Florida, yeah. Yeah, and I think he even has he can he has one in Vegas now too. I think he's 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 with the Metro. I think he has like a a badge with the Las Vegas, no, yeah, Vegas Metro. Okay. Yeah, that kind but of he's like, to, like look for him. <laughs> yeah, I know he's awesome. He's awesome. But even you know you don't see him on SWAT raids. You don't see him on all that stuff like that. So. And that's the thing. Like he set this whole thing up. He ingratiated himself with Jesse. He started talking to Jesse's ex-girlfriends who are also meth users. And, yeah. you know, it's okay for them to be meth users and their statement stands. But because Jesse's a meth user, his statement doesn't stand. So oh, I yeah. think what he thought was going to happen is that they were going to put out this blog, which was 130 pages, Lisa, of them basically blaming Jesse for this murder with, their idea and their theory and calling it the truth. So we feel that like they put, they arrested Jesse for this meth charge, uh, drug charge, gun charge, put him away, put out this blog and was hoping everybody was just going to believe the blog and think, okay, Jesse killed his brother. That's the end of it. Case closed. Move on. We're done. Yeah. And we were like, that's not fair. Yeah. They, he, he's you. already in prison so they can slow down the investigation. They don't have to rush because he's he's already behind bars for 80 years for that stuff. Yeah. And then shit that he's owned up to. That's, yeah. that's yes. like it's shit that he's owned up to. He's like, you know what? I effed up. I'm going to own up with my stuff. But at the same time, I'm owning up to it because I want my life back and I want the relationships that I have with, that I had previously to using drugs. Mm -hmm. So he saw this as a way of an opportunity to finally cut the crap and get clean and get sober. So that way he can then advocate for himself, but he can continue to advocate for his brother and continue to stay on the ground that I have nothing to do with this. And I want this solved just as much as everyone else. And I think what's also forgotten about is the fact of 
Jesse could have possibly have been using because of the loss of his brother, because of the trauma. And it's not an excuse, but he could yeah. have, yes, he could have been doing it before, but maybe there was an increase of usage and an increase of different things because he didn't have the, the, the emotional and psychological assistance to go ahead and cope. And that's, yeah. that's a high probability of what was done. I mean, well, I'm I think, gonna... it, I, yeah, I, I think that's less likely. I think it's more likely it's the culture down there. It's yeah. everybody that we've been down there a few times now. And yeah, that seems to be everybody, you know. There's a lot of people who have meth problems and it's part of, it's part of the social life too. I mean, they just, that's the way they party down there. And then it's also a way for some of those people to make money. You know, you, you, he, we, you know, we, we even asked him, we almost, you know, he, he was almost giving up who his dealers were. Yeah. But let's clarify. It's not everybody down there. There is just, you know, this group of people that are involved in this case, they were all involved in the meth game. But yeah. not everybody who lives down there is is a meth person. It's just unfortunate that this group of people, that's just kind of what their daily existence was like. And Jesse was right in there with the rest of the group. Yep. But he was also an outsider because he'd been gone. He'd come back for a short period of time. He yep. had an altercation with his ex-girlfriend. There was, you know, some kind of thing, domestic thing that got dismissed. He and was overseas. He, he yeah. moved from there to Texas, stayed in Texas for a couple more years and didn't come back until his father died. So- yeah. You know, and then he went to Pennsylvania. So it's like, yep. yeah, he was in Pennsylvania before. He was in Pennsylvania yeah. before he went to Texas. But okay. so he was he was in and out of this world. And then, you know, he comes back, he spends a few months with his brother, and then this happens. Yeah. And he, I think one of the most important takeaways regarding their relationship is the fact of how he advocates for his brother when he comes back and and he's living there, he's living at um at the residence, I guess it's the grandmother's residence. Yep. And Colt tries to come ahead and stay there. And he goes, well, if I'm staying here, he's staying here. And if you don't like it, then we're both leaving. Exactly. So yeah. 14 year old age shift. There, there's the 14 year gap, but he still, he had, he had that closeness to defend him in terms of that. Like if I can stay here, he can stay here. We're equally just as effed up. So yeah. why pick and choose? I think he just, from my observation of Jesse, he really wants or wanted, or maybe still does to have some kind of family unit to have some kind of family connection, but he screwed up so many times with drugs. He's just feels like he doesn't even deserve it at this point. And I think that his family, that the ones that are still around have turned against him and, you know, they, they're just, you know, and they're, they're actually pointing the finger at him too. And so, which leads to like the confusion that has been created by this narrative between this reserve officer and this other attorney who's friends with uh, the family, the, the con nip family. So it's like, you know, so it's, it's a very, it's, it's a twisted tale and, you know, but we obviously we're not boots on the ground, but, you know, we get to talk to people who reach out to us and these people know all these people. So when it all came out, you know, we had to step, step back and say, all right, well maybe, you know, we're off point here. And then at, in that year, we found out some other stuff that when we realized that we weren't too far off point, as that uh, we had someone who had seen some of the FBI files and they couldn't tell me what it was in it. But I just asked them, I said, listen, are we on the right path? And they said, it was for all intents and purposes, yes, you're on the right path. So right now, I think where the investigation stands is the, the BIA's pretty much only investigating Molly's case, even though they're probably looking at Colts because she's Chickasaw. And that's the other thing. I think because of that, they thought that they could throw Jesse in jail for this, create this blog. No one was going to question it because Jesse's a druggie. We're going to write this blog called The Truth. We're going to put it out there. He's in jail anyway, so we'll just blame Colt's murder on him. And that's the end of it because no one's really investigating Colt's murder. But yeah. the BIA is looking into Molly. And Colt, and I'm pretty sure that they're. Probably I'm sure they're looking, looking at the Colt too, but the fact is, Colt wasn't Chickasaw. Molly was, yeah. so they don't. It made it very convenient for this cop and this attorney to create this blog, The Truth, which has now been suspended. They took it down, and they they wrote a statement. Oh, I was kind of hoping you were telling me that the attorney also got suspended, or possibly like in the process of being no, disqualified. No, no, because I don't think we don't. We don't know. But all we know is yesterday morning we. Uh, 
someone sent us a statement from the blog because they took it down saying that they took it down because they want to take the temperature down and that they forwarded all their information to the current investigative body. And like, so in that way, it seems, I, I don't know what happened to, to spur that, but it's good that it's down because it's not, it's not the truth. It's not the truth. And we, we don't know the truth. We don't know the truth. We don't come out and say, oh, well, we know exactly who did it. No, we don't. We don't know. So yeah. to say it's the truth and mislead people like that and to blame someone so blatantly, blame Jesse so blatantly with no evidence, it just kind of made our blood boil. Yeah. So it was just not right. I'll say this. I'd be more than happy to get on a plane and go down there and arrange a visit with Jesse and bring the polygraph instrument with me. And just to further take a like, take the truth, like take whatever they're saying actually transpired and break it down and administer an examination on the basis of the document. Because if they're saying he did A, let's prove it and let's show the fact that you have nothing to do with it and let's test B. Well, so he saying, you heard him on the podcast. He's he, more he'll do it. He said that he goes, he yeah. actually offered to take a polygraph before all this stuff happened. And they and the the officer, the reserve officer basically said. Oh no, you wouldn't you wouldn't do good on it. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> That's his way of saying we're not going to give it to you because I'm just going to assume that you're going to pass and I'm not going to give you the honor the benefit of the doubt to go ahead and prove your innocence. It, it, who, who, who what law enforcement officer or detective or like investigator would prevent someone who they think is a suspect from taking a polygraph? Someone that they know is going to pass, which will then go ahead and change their narrative. That's the only reason why. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you can absolutely extend it to him and let him know that if he really wants to do this at some oh, point. Oh, we already did. We are we we yeah, we, yeah, we, we told him we said, listen, we know somebody that you know if you want to. And yeah. um, but yeah, I don't unfortunately I don't think it's gonna be necessary, but like you know, because like we've spoken to a couple other people who interviewed him and I I was point blank. I go, Hey, listen, do you think he is he a suspect? And they 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 all said no. They all said yeah. no. So it's like and, but like I said, we don't know who did it No. and, yeah. but to throw someone under the bus because well, you, you have an easy target. Well, he's an easy target. And who was going to stand up for him? Nobody. They well, that's the whole thing. I mean, that's why I'm bringing up the polygraph because the whole idea of Jesse going ahead and not only admitting to obviously the crime that he did, but he, he's making sure that he's getting the help that he needed because he wants to change his reputation and he wants to fix the relationship. And like you mentioned before, Cindy, he's, he screwed up enough times with his family where his fans kind of written him off, which is why if he does the polygraph also, it gives him an opportunity to show his family that aren't convinced because of reading this blog or whatever preset um, thoughts that they have that he did do it. It's like, look, he, I didn't do it. Like yeah. I want to, I want to use this as a tool to help mend the relationship with my family and to show the fact that I have nothing to do with this. Yeah. What do you think about people who dismiss polygraph as a way of identifying deception? Because there's a lot of people who always say, "Oh, polygraph." Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, I think that the biggest factor of a lot of people coming out and saying, "Oh, it's BS" and this and that, are people that have taken exams and have failed. And they've got caught for different things. That's usually the first thing. And the second thing I like to say is the polygraph works when someone passes. If someone fails, that's where they go, oh, this is BS. It doesn't work. And this is garbage. You don't know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. But you wouldn't say that if you passed the exam. And that's something that I always like to tell everyone and remind them for the forefront of the polygraph. Will, it works. It's just that you don't like when it doesn't work and it's not in your favor. Um, but what people also have to remember or at least learn is that the polygraph is there to clear the innocent. We do not use it as a tool to catch the guilty. If we catch you along the way, then we catch you along the way. The whole idea is to rule out suspects during a criminal investigation and or rule out um, suspects pertaining to just everyday life pertaining to a certain search, like a circumstance, even could be a work related matter. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily one of those things that are just, oh my God, don't do it. It's a tool. It's not just the only thing that police use during an investigation. It is a tool in the toolbox. And also in the toolbox are interview techniques, interrogation techniques, um, statement analysis pertaining to handwriting of looking for deception. So these are all little tools that go into the toolbox. You do not just use the polygraph independently. Yeah. And then I, I want to ask real quick one question. Now, a lot of people 
they hear it all on TV and stuff like that. It says uh, polygraphs not admissible in court, but th- it is in some states. Can you kind of tell dispel that myth? Yeah. So the biggest thing that I hear is I'm not taking a polygraph because it's not admissible in court, and I call BS. Um, clearly, if you're doing research on polygraph, you should probably be looking up admissibility also. Polygraphs are admissible in all federal states, in all federal venues. So that's civil, criminal, and including immigration court. I do testing even for immigration when people are trying to go ahead and acquire citizenship and they go through the appeal process. Um, For let's say New York, I can give the example of New York, it's allowed pre-conviction and post-conviction. So if I have an individual that takes an exam and he goes, okay, well, I was charged with a bank robbery, which technically is a federal crime, but let's say um, it's a smaller amount. He's being charged for, let's say even theft. Um, I didn't do it. So that's your pre-conviction of they're charging me with this, but I didn't do it. I'll take the test and they pass, then it can go to court. But let's say there is a situation with regards to um, a bank robbery where you have got someone that drives the getaway car, another person um, takes the money, another person even shoots the guard. Well, you've got three people being all charged with the same thing. Why should the person that drove the getaway car be charged with the same crimes as shooting the guard? And so that would be one of those situations where I wanted, he wants to take a test to show what his level of involvement was to kind of make sure he gets reduced charges. And then the way other end of it is the post-conviction side where you've got an individual that has been convicted of a crime, they're currently incarcerated, and they want to take a polygraph to prove their innocence um, to get out of the facility because they were wrongfully convicted. And um, all three of us know that we have a very close friend that was in a situation like that, that had taken an exam, um, and he is loving life right now and uh, being the best man that he can be in this world, and I love him dearly. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, he's always the first person that I think of whenever Marty. I talk about this, um, bet- between Marty and Valentino and just that, just that network of colleagues and friends. And at this point, we're family. Uh, yeah. because of everything that we've all been through. And uh, but just going back to the admissibility, it's about um, 25, 26 states where it is allowed entered into evidence. But the reason why a lot of states don't allow it is because there's a lot of scientific research and there's also bias where, <laughs> I mean, if the two of you are sitting on a jury and, and we go, hey, there's polygraph evidence and they passed, because of what you guys know about polygraph and what you guys have seen on TV or heard in the media, you have a bias. And at that point, the polygraph becomes the judge and the jury. So that's why a lot of states like to make sure that the polygraph is not entered into evidence because of that previous bias. Yeah. Well, anything that'll give them a certain amount of leverage to dispute it. Mm-hmm. But they're always do- they're doing that with all the evidence. You know, as we all know, it's like, you know, you could be you could be caught red handed with something. But if you're in court and they have some evidence that, you know, competes with that, they're going to lean on that and they're going to kind of distance. It's like, don't look here. Look here, you know. Well, that's the thing, too. That's why this whole thing is so important, because if Jesse is being accused of something he didn't do, they're putting all their attention on that. But yet the murderer is over here outside living a life. Yeah. Not only living a life, we don't know who this person is and what their criminal history is to present debt. Or like persons. Or persons, exactly. So there could be an individual, there could be a group, whatever it is, and we don't know what they're doing. We don't know if there could be an influx of drugs coming in and out of the county because of these group of people. We don't know if there are possible other missing persons cases that are unsolved that are possibly tied to the same person that's responsible for this case. There could be anything. I mean, anything is possible. And it just, it's its horrible, absolutely horrible that this one individual has taken it upon himself to come up with some theory, narrative idea in their head and force it. It's not even pushing. You're forcing it down people's throats in the community and to the family and friends of Jesse. And Jesse cannot do jack shit other than being interviewed by you guys to advocate for him because he's trying to better his life by owning up to his crimes in addition to going ahead and getting the help and treatment 
he needs to be a productive and healthy individual. Yeah. It's, and I, exactly. the, the funny thing is, is that just recently, after we started to do this and Jesse's interview, people started coming out in his defense and yeah. started telling us more people that we've known about for years who were afraid to speak are now speaking because they're like, they saw the injustice that was being done to him and also revealing what a lot of the people, the players in the area were involved with. And we're finding out why, probably why the investigation dragged on the way it did locally and had to be moved to the state and then, then to federally because a lot of the players involved were CIs working with the local law enforcement. Yeah. And, you know, so they were, you know, they weren't getting, they were like getting, con, they were getting preferential treatment and they were allowed to run those. I mean, like, you know, like we said before, Joe Russell's son was running a meth lab out of his own house and using his, his truck, his sheriff's truck to deliver drugs over the border. So it's like, you know, it, it goes deep, it goes way deeper than these murders. And I yeah. think that's the problem why it's, it's it's drug on for so long because it'll implicate a lot of people. Oh yeah. And, I mean, think about all of the crimes that we know about right? and the amount yeah. of people that should be held accountable. Then think about the amount of crimes that we don't know about and the implications of those individuals. I mean, you're going to have the entire, the entire County for those that are involved in this negative behavior, obviously not the good, good abiding law citizens, but it's going to be like a family reunion meets a high school reunion meets God only knows what hanging out in, in jail. Yeah. Um, but because the corruption is so high up on the top, they're not even going to make it to jail. No. And that's the issue. It's, it's, it's the dog chasing its tail scenario mm -hmm. where you get caught, nothing happens, you do it again, and it's just this loop-de-loop, -loop, and it's just nauseating at this point. Like, get me off the ride. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. It's a, it's a merry-go-round that's not going to stop. And then, you know, like I said, I always said before, it's going to, take some, it might be a, a deathbed confession of, uh, cause some of these guys that were running with those people there, uh, we've heard that some of them aren't doing so well mm -hmm. and, you know, or someone's going to come out, come out and have some evidence, but you know, the bodies as we probably know are probably no longer exists. So it's going to have to be something like that. Unless, unless they do exist somewhere, we've been getting tips and locations and stuff. The problem is, is that we can't go do it. You know, yeah. we did it once before we, you know, when law enforcement, you know, we, you know, we had control over the property because we, you know, the, the property owner basically wanted it done and he basically financed it all yeah. and, you know, drained a pond and excavated and did it. And we brought Mac out and we brought Cheryl, you know, we brought, um, Marino. Marino Connell and we brought them out. And so, but now we're kind of like, now that the BIA is involved, they're like, hey, stop that. They go, we're going to search all those areas, but we got to do it in the right way. So hopefully that's going to be happening soon. Hopefully, you know, we we give them information. They don't tell us anything. We just give it to them. And hopefully the stuff that people are sending to us and it's going to yield, you know, results, but it's in their hands at this point. And yeah. so all we can do is just, you know, when things come up like this with Jesse, it was like, we, we, we had no idea what he was going to say to us, but, you know, we had a feeling that he wasn't involved, but after listening to him, and like I said, we talked to him for like two weeks straight, you know, every day for as long as he can talk on the phone. We're like, whoa, we got to get this out there because I, I don't think, you know, he's telling the truth. I mean, he was so, well, I mean, like you said, Lisa, they had such, you know, they zeroed in on him so hard. It was like, this is it. He's the guy. That's it. There was no other route. And I was like, well, where's the evidence? Yeah. I mean, the blog even had photographs of how he choked him out, like, you know, using like military, like because he was choking in the army. Because he was in the army. He goes, well, he learned yeah. this. You know, like, you know, like step by <laughs> step. Know this is what he did. Yeah. Like that, that's beyond of a reach. That's going ahead and taking advantage of someone's background of what you know and trying. It's like a, it's like taking a puzzle and you're forcing the circle to go in the square and it doesn't fit. But you're just going to jam it in and wedge it. And exactly. going, back to, going back to what you guys said before, it's okay for this individual to go ahead and conduct interviews with individuals that are currently under the influence of methamphetamines or any drugs and take their word.
but it's not okay to take Jesse's word where he is stone cold sober and this is what he's saying. Why is it okay to listen to someone then versus not now? And that's also another irritating part that bothers me. But uh, I mean, has anyone... He's he's getting these people to to say what he needs them to say to fit his narrative. Because they're under the influence. Right. And he's also calling it the truth. Yeah. Well, are you give calling me that guy? Truth? Give me that guy, and I will have a field day because I'm just, I'm like literally, I'm holding my hands and I'm just like, I don't know what to do with myself because I just, it just aggravates the shit out of me just to know that someone is in a law enforcement capacity. Well, but- not only that, he was, you know, he, the, the blog was written by a lawyer. Yeah. The lawyer <laughs> that's defending the guy that was driving the car during the car chase. Yeah. Yeah. We had him on the podcast. The, the, the whole thing, we had that guy on the podcast because he reached out to me. And I'm like, oh, we have a legal person who's local. I'd love to have him on. And he, he says he knows these people. He was actually, for I think three or, to four, us. three or four years, he was the actual uh, DA, the prosecutor for Love County. And then mm-hmm. he was summarily, he had a, a, an issue or uh, something that went on and then he wasn't there anymore. So then he appointed the the guy who was there during this whole thing. But we've, I figured, well, we have someone who has inside knowledge here of the yeah. environment, the legal system, and he's willing to talk to us. So, And then it quickly realized that he was defending a lot of the stuff that was going on because I would ask him, well, this, you know, as far as legally, what can they do? And, and I asked him, um, the, the really funny question is, is that during the time I go, he was like sitting there and I asked him, Paula, he goes, I go, if your, you know, niece child, whatever, was Molly. I go, would you do everything in your power, even if it went beyond the realm of, you know, legality and stuff like that, to try to find answers to the killers? And he goes, yes, I would. And he goes, in fact, he goes, the fact that Paula is not a law enforcement entity, she can do a lot of things that cops can't do, you know, because like, you know, she can't, she can go on, she can just walk on people's property and she'll get a trespassing, you know, cop needs a warrant. You know, she can go and interview people and they people cops need to have probable cause to, to arrest someone to bring them in. For. She doesn't have to do that. And that's why she was so, you know, uh, she did like a guerrilla warfare yep. investigation, not even knowing what to do. She just knew she was I got to find answers. I got to talk to people. And, you know, and it's the the basis of a lot of that that work that she's done that the law enforcement has now, you know, eons and we have tons of information yeah. from her that we we have never been through the entire thing we've been through like no yes we have i have well maybe you have, no, I not have. Me. i've been through of thousands, of thousands, <laughs> thousands of pages it's like marty's case was thousands and thousands of pages yeah um but the thing is with that lawyer so he was at the same time talking to us was representing the nip family unbeknownst to us at the time. It's a clear conflict of interest. And the thing is, is that that individual came on the podcast to do a recording under false pretenses. And right. they came to use it as a platform. And that's it. That's just effed up. I mean, I'm not going to start with the profanity and every every four little word that I want to throw against the wall right now. But it's just that there was an ulterior motive. Yeah. And yeah. that just, and, it, and things like that, that take place. I understand that an attorney is there to represent their client. But their attorney also takes an oath to go ahead and make sure that there is some sort of value to truth and justice. Yeah. And and yeah. that's where we get crooked attorneys working with crooked law enforcement. And you get crooked DAs that are just trying to make numbers and make cases. I mean, I can think I could think of two two agencies. And I mean, I've been sitting through Netflix binging two different shows. I've been watching, I don't know if you guys have seen it, City on a Hill. And then there was another one about uh the uh, Boston Police Department. There, yeah, that was that one, and there's one about Maryland. But just to see the crime and corruptions between like the, the 80s and 90s, and what goes on with crooked DAs, and these are all coming from real stories. Yeah, um, yeah they are. Know, I mean, I mean, the big, the biggest thing is when you start look, when you start looking like Suffolk County with Marty. When you looked at, the, oh, they, had a, they had a, they had a night at the time when he was arrested. They had a 90 percent conviction rate. I mean, that's there's the nobody problem. that has that. That's no. that should. No, and that's how many years later, and we still don't have that. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It just it's ridiculous. Oh, it makes my blood yeah. boil. Yeah. Yeah, it's infuriating. All right. Well, listen. Thank you so much for taking a listen. We will of definitely, course. we'll definitely ask to see if he would be willing to take a polygraph. I don't think it's going to be necessary at this point. Yeah. I think you know the the flames have been fanned on this 
subject, but you never know. But you know, he, I'm, I'm sure he would be willing to do it regardless. Oh, yeah. He said he would. So if yeah. it ever came down to it, then we would, you know, definitely have you talk to him. Um, but right now, I think it's best to just kind of let him. Yeah. He said his through. piece. He said what he had to say. You know. Well, now that the blog is taken down to, quote, unquote, yeah. change the temperature, I think that it will give him an opportunity to also know that it's taken down and he can kind of do what he needs to do and focus on himself. Should anything arise, I think that at that point, it would be a good time for him to go ahead and get his story out there yeah. um, and, and use the exam and just, uh, I'd print it and I'd mail it to his family members. I'd, I'd mail it to the chief of, I would, I would send it to absolutely everyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on the Facebook page yeah. and just show mm -hmm. he has no involvement. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think it's, it's important. Yeah. But thank you so much. Well, Don't, hang up. Guys. Don't hang up when we're done. because. Uh, you're not listening, don't worry. Okay. Thanks, guys. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, bye.